All Religions Are One by William Blake. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Voice of One Crying in the Wilderness. The Argument. As the true method of knowledge is experiment, the true faculty of knowing must be the faculty which experiences. This faculty I treat of. First principle. That the poetic genius is the true man, and that the body or outward form of man is derived from the poetic genius. Likewise that the forms of all things are derived from their genius, which by the ancients was called an angel and spirit and demon. Second principle. As all men are alike in outward form, so, and with the same infinite variety, are all alike in the poetic genius. Third principle. No man can think, write, or speak from his heart, but he must intend truth. Thus all sects of philosophy are from the poetic genius, adapted to the weaknesses of every individual. Principle four. As none by traveling over known lands can find out the unknown, so from already acquired knowledge man cannot acquire more therefore an universal poetic genius exists principle five the religions of all nations are derived from each nation's different reception of the poetic genius which is everywhere called the spirit of prophecy principle six the jewish and christian testaments are an original derivation from the poetic genius this is necessary from the confined nature of bodily sensation seventh principle as all men are alike though infinitely various so all religions and as all similars have one source the true man is the source he being the poetic genius end of all religions are one by william blake Appropriate Clothes for the High School Girl by Virginia M. Alexander This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appropriate Clothes for the High School Girl from College Bulletin, number 74, February 1, 1920. College of Industrial Arts, the State College for Women, Denton, Texas by Virginia M. Alexander, Director, Department of Fine and Applied Art. Someone asked recently, why all this agitation on the subject of high school girls' dress? Interest in this subject has certainly increased during the last several years, and the high school girl herself is directly responsible for this interest. It has been said that no great evil exists but contains the seeds of its own cure. The costumes worn to school by the high school girls of our country have been gradually going from bad to worse with the years. Mothers and teachers have striven to do what they could to correct matters, but not until the girls themselves realized that this great weakness existed, and they resolved to seek a cure, were real results noticeable. The representative high school girls of our country are making a stand for good taste and democracy in the clothes they wear to school. This little bulletin is published with the hope that its suggestions may be of value to those students who truly desire to raise the standards of dress among the girls of their school. Many a girl feels, when she first enters high school, that she is a child no longer. She has suddenly become a woman, and she must demonstrate this fact to the world immediately by her clothes. Gingham dresses, middies, and low heel shoes are scorned as belonging to the days that are gone. Hair, once lovely for its natural beauty and simplicity, takes on fearful and wonderful lines. French heels only are to be considered, and a georgette blouse with elaborate camisole or a silk dress is an absolute necessity. With these acquisitions, our young lady is ready for her new undertaking. Could she possibly make a greater mistake? The schoolroom is not a style show, nor a social function but it is a busy workshop where material is to be assembled from which to build a life in a truly good high school of all places a student must do or die 
and there is no time here to be wasted on thoughts of frills and furbelows. Schoolroom walls and blackboards do not make consistent backgrounds for party clothes. In the past, the high school girl who was considered well-dressed by her associates was the one who was elaborately dressed. Now, since the girls of our country are interested in all the big world issues of the day and have taken efficiency as their watchword, the girl who is a leader is the girl who can do, not the girl who can dress. One of the surest tests of good judgment and refinement in a girl is her selection of clothes. The overdressed girl does not belong to the wealthiest and most cultured families as a rule. She is often striving to attain a social goal not yet realized, and the schoolroom and the street offer her only opportunities to show her fine feathers. Suggestions for the school dress If a girl should not wear fanciful clothes to school, just what, then, should she wear? In a general way, I will answer that question. A high school girl should wear dresses made of good, substantial material, appropriate for its wearing quality and interesting for its color and texture. These dresses should be made on lines becoming to the individual girl who is to wear the dress, and at the same time designed so that they will stand the wear and tear to which they will be subjected. Dangling tassels, sashes, and fluffy ruffles divert the attention of both the wearer and the observer, and by their very inappropriateness make the owner conspicuous. Above all, the school dress, which is a work dress, should allow the wearer free use of her limbs and muscles, and should promote her general good health. A schoolgirl in a dress built on the lines of a Peter Thompson or Hofflin suit with proper accessories in the way of shoes, stockings, and coiffure has much more style than her little sister in Georgette or Velvet. This type of suit is becoming to almost any girl as the collar, tie, and belt may be varied to suit each individual, and the design has become almost as staple as flour and sugar in the pantry. As a result, these dresses, made of good material, may be worn for several years without going out of style. Ready-made suits of this type are quite expensive, but patterns are easily secured, and any one who sews may make a successful garment, if a little care is exercised. Gingham, linen, and percale dresses built on simple lines, so that they may be laundered without becoming stretched and misshapen, are always satisfactory and pleasing. In cold weather, serge and tricotine make splendid but expensive substitutes for the washable materials. The dress with a washable underblouse. The linen or serge jumper dress made with a washable underblouse is a most satisfactory garment for the school dress. It is not only utilitarian, but it is also comfortable and attractive on account of its many possible variations. It is becoming to almost all types of girls, from the very young girl, often found in the first year of high school, to the dignified senior. The dress proper, built on simple lines, will stand hard wear, and the fact that the underblouse may be laundered or changed will give freshness and variety to the costume. The very young girl who has not learned to care successfully for her wristbands will find this feature most valuable. In warm climates or overheated schoolrooms, the light weight of the underblouse will prove very comfortable. This dress, made of wool, may be worn quite late in the spring, and a silk blouse will be the most useful for the winter months. Made of gingham or linen, the dress will be a valuable asset in the summer wardrobe, particularly in the South. Georgette crepe is not an appropriate material for this undergarment, or for any other school garment. Its perishable nature and its transparency make it prohibited for the schoolroom. A very transparent outer garment demands a most carefully selected undergarment, and more often than not, this care is not wisely exercised by the wearer. A white shirtwaist and dark skirt is a very utilitarian combination, but from an art standpoint it is not considered good design. For a costume to possess art quality it must have unity. The wearer and her clothes should create an impression of oneness. The sudden change at the waistline from a light waist to a dark skirt cuts the figure into two parts, destroying this much desired quality of unity. The proper use of line about the face. The truly well-dressed girl, and the one who displays good judgment, is not the girl who slavishly adopts the new styles and fads of the day, regardless of whether they are becoming to her individually or not. This applies also to the way she dresses her hair. There is no part of a toilet that influences the effect of the whole more than the hair. The most becoming gown fails in its function if the hair is tousled or dressed unbecomingly. 
many girls fail to realize how they may overcome some of nature's faults and shortcomings and how they may counteract the effect of bad features and proportions by the correct use of line when dressing the hair if earmuffs become stylish the little round-faced girl who knows nothing of art or design as related to herself must bulge her hair over her ears whether it makes a full moon of her face or not girls should dress in style but styles should be modified to suit each individual the hair is a frame for the face the delicate blonde and the strenuous athletic brunette may no more wear the same coiffure than they may safely wear the same colors a miniature and an oil painting would certainly not be framed alike the slender girl with a narrow face and thin neck should be most careful with the use of line around her face hair combed in on the cheeks and high and back from the forehead will make more evident her slenderness a hard neckline or chains and ties repeating the point of her chin will make it appear more angular soft flowing lines in the hair worn low on the forehead and back from the cheeks should be adopted the round-faced girl should conscientiously avoid coiffures which broaden the proportions of her face also necklines and beads that repeat the curve of her chin suggestions for the stout figure a girl may not only improve the appearance of her face and head by the proper use of line but she may do wonders with her figure as well if she knows how to properly design her dresses a dress wonderfully becoming to a slender sylph-like girl may become a tragedy on her plump classmate every girl should understand her physical makeup as thoroughly as she does her disposition with its strong points and its weaknesses she should know the kind of line she may wear successfully in her dresses and the colors that are most becoming to her and the types of materials most suitable for her the stout girl should carefully avoid a design in a dress that is too cut up or complicated tunics and less long and scant are unfortunate usually and the interest created by trimming about the waistline or elaborate belts should never be indulged in by the stout girl length producing lines should always be planned and light or colored collars should always be designed so that interest will not be created out toward the sides of the figure creating width but down the center front instead contrasting shoes and stockings not only cut from the height of the figure but help to accent the feet and ankles of the wearer the girl who wears white shoes with her dark dress states by so doing that she considers her feet well worth public consideration contrasting materials for sleeves or elaborate cuffs or pockets will add width to any figure the designs in the accompanying illustration are most suitable for the older schoolgirl when made up of wool or linen materials i may safely recommend this type of line in design for the girl of superfluous weight plaid and figured materials our stores in the early spring and summer show such fascinating plaid and figured materials that i feel their use should be considered almost everyone has fallen a victim to a wonderfully colored plaid on display to discover later that buying a plaid is a much simpler matter than making it into a dress plaids are fatal for stout people area is the impression always created by them and unless the pattern is very small and the colors very soft and indefinite they should be reserved for the use of children and young girls there is no colored costume that will make a woman more conspicuous than one made of a large black and white plaid material in selecting a pattern for a girl's plaid dress care should be used to secure one with as few seams as possible every seam is a danger zone only persons with great poise and power of concentration if they notice their surroundings at all will be able to remain unaffected by a conspicuous seam when the plaids don't hit some plaids are designed so that it is very difficult to match the pattern in the seams of the skirt or a stretch selvage will add to the difficulty a gored skirt pattern making bias seams necessary should never be used for plaid material armholes and shoulder seams should be carefully planned a kimono sleeve simplifies the armhole problem but will not prove so satisfactory in a wash dress plain material either white or colored makes a happy combination with plaids or figured material the accompanying designs are particularly becoming to slender girls the wide soft belts and collars and the contrasting materials in the sleeves will seemingly add weight to slender young figures in planning tucks and band trimming for a skirt the result will be much more pleasing if variety is used in the width of the bands and the spaces between the bands 
appropriate clothes for the street. If the schoolroom is not an appropriate place for elaborate or fanciful clothes, surely the street is less so. The truly refined woman will never wear those things on the street that will make her conspicuous. Here, all classes of people meet and mingle, supposedly on business bent, and the girl who appears in this public place in party clothes shows either very poor judgment, or that she is striving to attract public attention in the cheapest way possible. The most stylish girls seen in the city streets are those gowned in simple, well-made dresses or tailored suits. Hats, gloves, and shoes should be as carefully considered as the dress itself, and all should harmonize. A simple, dark silk dress is almost an essential for street wear in spring and summer, to replace the heavier suit or serge dress. Taffeta is an excellent material for this dress and makes a much cooler and more youthful dress than satin. A taffeta dress needs little trimming, if cut on interesting lines. Buttons, tucks, and plaited frills of the same material may be used most effectively. Little bits of hand embroidery or attractive light collar and cuff sets add much charm to this type of dress. Bright colors should not appear upon the street. A loud color attracts attention as successfully as a loud noise. Any dark, neutral color becoming to the wearer is well for the street dress. Wool mixtures and tweeds are particularly good for suits built on box or belted lines. Sport clothes will give the young girl a wonderful opportunity for the use of brilliant color. Dresses worn at home and for afternoon and evening functions permit the use of delicate colors, more elaborate trimming, and more perishable materials. Remember that a hat should serve a double function. It should act as a covering for the head, and its lines and color should enhance the attractiveness of the wearer. The Graduation Dress One of the most important events in the life of every girl is her graduation, and we shall here consider the dress worn by her when she has fulfilled all the requirements and that long-anticipated day arrives. This occasion is not one for splendor and show and the cue for the girl graduate is modesty and simplicity. She is not supposed to be a radiant queen bedecked for a festive occasion, but a charming young girl equipped and ready to begin life as a young woman. The simple and beautiful graduation dress of the past has assumed more elaborate proportions during recent years, until it has reached the point where the students themselves realize that a halt must be called. Georgettes, chiffons, and expensive nets have supplanted cotton weaves, and elaborate creations of lace and satin are not infrequent. The cost of the dress itself is increased by such expensive accessories as long white kid gloves, expensive slippers, and stockings. What is the girl whose parents possess only moderate means to do under these conditions? Perhaps she is graduating with honors. Is she to be embarrassed by having to play a Cinderella role by the side of her gorgeously attired classmates? Or shall she strain the family bank account and spend money for this ornate apparel that should be spent for the education or maintenance of other members of her family? Surely this is a time when the American girl may show her real spirit of democracy. Instead of selecting a handsome dress, which she often excuses by saying she wishes to use it afterwards for an evening dress, she will choose a really more charming one made of less expensive material, which will give her an opportunity to show her originality and make her personal charms more appreciated. In many high schools, the unfairness of an expensive graduation dress has been so much appreciated by the students that a price limit has been set for the graduation outfit, and the girl who violates this understanding is considered a real offender. The girls who have initiated this have been, in many cases, those girls who could best afford the expensive garments, and by such acts they have demonstrated that they are to make the splendid American women of the future who will lead in those movements that bring about the greatest good for the greatest number. I feel that organdy leads all other materials as desirable for the graduation dress. It is a trifle more expensive than some other possible materials, but its sheerness and crispness give character to the dress, making little trimming necessary. A dress of this material may be worn for quite a while, as a little pressing always revives its freshness. There are some qualities of flaxen that rival organdy as a desirable material, and a dress of this may be laundered with perfect safety. If lace is used on the graduation dress, do not sacrifice quality for quantity. A small amount of good lace skillfully used will make a much handsomer garment than one festooned with rows of a cheap quality, 
a self-trimmed organdy dress is very distinctive dainty little frills and pin tucks may be used in many interesting ways and they may be planned so as to be becoming to almost any figure daintiness should be the characteristic quality of the graduation dress it is always disappointing to see elaborate jewelry worn with these charming frocks in many cases the most valued possessions of the family have been collected for the occasion and this borrowed finery always makes a discordant note in the harmony of the young wearer's costume under no consideration substitute imitation jewelry for the genuine article patterns for these dresses may be secured at the college of industrial arts how to secure patterns of these dresses the college of industrial arts in its efforts to be of service to the girls and women of texas has made it possible for those desiring patterns of the graduation dresses illustrated in this bulletin to secure them through the department of extension at the college the original designs of these dresses were made by highly trained artists at the college whom we feel appreciate the particular needs of texas girls and women the patterns were cut from these original designs by the vogue pattern company of new york and are sold at thirty cents each their exact cost to the college an illustration material requirement and approximate cost are given with each pattern and they are cut in sizes fourteen sixteen and eighteen when ordering patterns state the number of the pattern and the size desired the quaint little design b eight twenty will appeal to the young girl who likes a touch of originality in her clothes the becoming fichu and full skirt of this design seem to belong to the colonial days with powdered hair and patches this design created of organdy should cost from five dollars to eight dollars according to the material selected number b eight twenty two will prove more expensive on account of its lace trimming the approximate cost being from nine dollars to twelve dollars if interesting materials are chosen this loose peplum and snug ribbon girdle will make quite a distinctive costume becoming to stout figures the long-waisted design b824 is decidedly original and its dainty frills and ribbons appeal to young girls a dress may be made by this pattern of good materials for eight dollars design b826 shows a clever interpretation of the narrow skirt so popular today the tiny tucks and frills make a dainty and inexpensive trimming and the costume should cost from four dollars to six dollars number b828 demonstrates that vertical ruffles may be used successfully the dress is beautiful when sheer material is used and the ruffles are picotted and plated it should cost about six dollars the slender girl who is not too thin through the bust is charming in design b833 the organdy sash and flounced peplum are designed particularly for her from six dollars to eight dollars should buy the material for this dress lingerie for the graduation dress the garment worn directly under the graduation dress has much to do with the effect of the dress itself this garment should not be picked up at random but the fullness of its skirt and the design around the neck should be planned to suit the particular dress pattern selected underwear is to the dress what the foundation is to a house and it should be built just as skillfully it is impossible to secure a dainty graceful effect in a dress when it is worn with a clumsy petticoat styles change in underwear just as they do in dresses and the silhouette of the outer garment must decide what the lines of the under one shall be for the present styles soft yielding materials are absolutely necessary for underwear and few flounces should be used about the bottom of the skirt if the clinging effect around the ankles and knees is desired in the dress elaborate lace trimmings are neither in good taste nor stylish and handwork constitutes the decoration on many of the most attractive of these garments colored lingerie and bright colored ribbons should be worn only when the dress is not transparent bright pink and blue ribbons in a camisole or chemise will always look a bit garish when viewed through a thin blouse color has a magnetic attraction for the eye and wherever placed immediately attracts attention to that spot i am sure refined girls do not wish to invite public interest in their lingerie through the use of bright colors in their ribbons the most delicate tints are permissible but should be used only in small quantities white only should be used with the graduation dress since several petticoats are apt to prove clumsy great care must be exerted in selecting the material for this undergarment to avoid too much transparency when worn under the very sheer organdy dress corsets and posture 
the envelope chemise and knickerbockers are very comfortable undergarments and are quite popular with most young girls of today they may be made most attractive when soft dainty materials are used and the needlework is carefully executed these garments should be kept quite simple if lace is used it should be in limited quantities and of a kind that may be laundered often little bits of dainty feather stitching and hand embroidery will add individual charm to these undergarments style depends not only upon the proper selection of clothes but very largely upon the way these clothes are put on and worn many girls wearing beautiful clothes are decidedly not stylish their clothes look as though they had fallen upon their owners this is caused by the fact that the wearer does not carry herself well or has not good poise nothing is so vitally necessary for good health and good looks as good posture the slouchy humped over girl is unattractive enough when young but when she develops into a misshapen woman with superfluous flesh about the abdomen and shoulders the most skillful artist will be unable to disguise her deformities the girl with the debutante slouch or the one who sits in her corsets is rarely graceful the uncorseted figure is the popular one today but if corsets must be worn they should be most carefully selected fortunately the long unyielding coats of mail of several years ago are now rarely seen on girls and soft flexible girdles leaving the figure with its natural lines and grace have appeared as substitutes a well-shapen brassiere is often necessary with these low busted girdles a stylish girl has good poise this means that she stands well walks well carries her head high her shoulders back and looks the world in the face the clothes worn by this girl will take the correct swing shoes and feet all organizations and publications keenly interested in the welfare of young women are making a strenuous effort to produce better american feet and this is to be done directly through the shoes worn by our girls the y w c a during the war discovered that lack of endurance among girls could be traced back directly to misshapen feet flattened arches weak backs and abdominal muscles in almost every case these had been caused by wearing high heel shoes the human body is built and strung so that a person may walk and stand with natural grace and ease when the equilibrium of this delicate mechanism is disturbed by inserting a spindle heel directly under that point responsible for most of the human weight it is not surprising that physical ails result that must be carried through life a french or spindle heel is absolutely inconsistent for any occasion when walking or standing is to be done and is certainly not artistic when worn with a tailored dress or suit vanity gratified by a foot that seemingly is a bit smaller should not compensate for the loss of good health good sense natural grace and efficiency an elaborate evening dress may call for a higher heel than the one worn on the street but it will not excuse the wobbly spindle heels sold girls by many ruthless concerns end of appropriate clothes for the high school girl by virginia m alexander read by colleen mcmahon the colossal elephant of coney island from the scientific american this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the reputation that the American people have long had of always doing everything on the grandest possible scale has lately received a very substantial confirmation in the two monuments that have recently been bestowed upon this country. The Washington Monument and the Statue of Liberty are the greatest works of art in height and magnitude that have been raised by the hands of man since the Tower of Babel. In addition to these, there is a third monument, facetiously styled the Eighth Wonder of the World, that has recently been raised in the neighborhood of New York that for one reason deserves to be named in the same connection with the foregoing namely on account of its size the colossal elephant at coney island has not been favored with much serious public attention owing to the fact principally that it is not an artistic work and secondly because it is the project and property of a stock company whose unexalted aim was to rear a structure that would serve not so much to elevate the public mind artistically nor to stand as a monument to some of our noted forefathers but rather to abstract the unwary dime from the inquisitive sightseer this fact and the grotesque nature and enormous size of the colossus has deprived it up to this time of much consideration 
but this should not deter us from inquiring how a building of such unique design and original construction was called into being. It was designed and built under the personal supervision of the architect Mr. J. Mason Kirby of Atlantic City, New Jersey. It was first intended to make an hotel, but later this idea was abandoned, and it was decided to construct the interior with the purpose of using it as an auditorium for concerts, etc., while the platform on the top, or the howdah, as it is termed, would serve as an observatory. The elephant is constructed of wood throughout and is covered with sheet tin. The total length from the trunk to the back part of the hind legs is 150 feet. The platform of the howdah is 88 feet from the ground, and the total height to top of crescent on flagpole is 150 feet. The height from ground to body, when standing immediately underneath, is 24 feet. The legs are 18 feet in diameter, and the two hind legs are provided with circular stairways leading to and from the rooms above. The first room reached in passing up the stairs is termed the stomach room, and is dignified with this title, not because it is provided with the wherewithal to cheer the inner man, but owing to its special location in the body of the beast. The different rooms in the animal are likewise christened after their particular location, as the thigh room, brain room, hip room, etc. The grand hall, or auditorium, is reached upon ascending the stairs, and this is found to be very spacious and airy, the ceiling being very high and slightly dome-shaped. A gallery passes all round the hall. At the further end of it, a flight of stairs leads to what forms, in fact, a continuation of the main hall, only on a higher plane. The main hall is 80 feet long and 32 feet wide, while the upper part of the main hall is 36 feet long and triangular in shape. There are 34 rooms in the structure in all, which are located principally between the walls of the hall and the outer walls of the structure. Most of them are quite small and are very extraordinary in shape their walls conforming to the shape without of that particular section of the colossus. The eyes which form the windows of two of these rooms are four feet in diameter. The tusks are 36 feet long and five feet eight inches in diameter. In laying the foundation of the structure, the builders met with some difficulty owing to the instability of the soil, it being simply a sandy beach. Piles were driven to a great depth and a solid platform was raised on top of the piles and secured firmly thereon. A second platform, which was designed to bear the direct weight of the Colossus, was constructed above this, and was supported on vertical timbers strengthened by inclined braces reaching to the platform, with a view of resisting great lateral as well as great vertical strains. After the foundations were completed, work was commenced upon the visible portion of the building, the legs being the first point of attack. Yellow pine posts, 12 by 16 inches, were first raised above the platform, and, being bolted to the flooring beneath, were made self-supporting. Two posts, 42 feet long, were thus raised in each leg, and 12 smaller timbers placed in a circle so as to enclose the main posts were also bolted to the platform in a similar manner to form the outer wall of the leg. These timbers were joined at the top by connecting beams. Cranes were mounted on the platforms thus formed, to which the material was raised as the work progressed. The difficulties increased, however, with the work, and it became necessary to secure the services of the most skilled workmen. Not only was this so on account of the dizzy height that the structure attained, but to the necessity of conforming the construction to the peculiar emergencies that arose, it being requisite to form nearly all the parts on the spot under the immediate personal supervision of the architect. The weight of the structure is carried, as may be seen by the engraving, by five supports, the four legs and the trunk. Commencing at what is now the flooring of the main hall, trusses were raised on each side and at the two ends of the hall, and these trusses, the bottom cords corresponding with the floor and the top cords with the ceiling of the hall, constitute the principal support of the ribs. It will be seen from this that what might be termed an immense box girder was formed the ends of which are supported by the front and hind legs, respectively. The ribs weigh directly upon the upper cords at the four corners, but at other points the ribs bear away from the cords, owing to the enlargement of the body under the howdah. At these points it was necessary to extend the vertical and horizontal members of each truss from the wall and ceiling until they intersected with ribs. In addition to this, an arched rib, 
corresponding to the backbone is carried from the main support of the hind legs to the neck of the monster where it bears indirectly upon the vertical support of the front legs the ribs in the body of the colossus are forty in number and each consists of six sections bolted firmly together as they serve to give consistency and rigidity to the whole structure they form an important element in its construction they are about seven inches in width and are placed two feet apart measuring from center to center the head framing is similar in general construction to that of the body and is supported by the trunk and forward supports of the front legs it is provided with twelve ribs great difficulty was experienced in raising the ears and adjusting them in position in the head this was principally due to their enormous weight some six tons each and the great height to which they had to be raised and the difficulty of securing such an enormous mass securely to drums which had been prepared to receive them in each side of the head in addition to being bolted firmly in position at these points iron rods were extended from the main trusses within through the ears at two points below the drum the ears are some thirty-four feet long by twenty feet wide the architect depends upon the enormous weight of the elephant and upon iron rods that pass from the trusses above through the legs and connect with the foundation platform to hold the colossus in its position he has kindly furnished us with a few statistics that may be of interest the colossus he informs us weighs about one hundred thousand tons it contains one million five hundred thousand square feet of timber and seven hundred kegs of nails were consumed in its construction in addition to this seven tons of bolts were disposed of and it required thirty five thousand square feet of tin to cover its surface in size it compares favorably with many of the large hotels and other structures in its neighborhood and some idea of its magnitude may be had by comparing it with a jumbo which is drawn in scale by its side and which would find plenty of room for a promenade within one of the legs of the colossus end of the colossal elephant of coney island from scientific american knowledge eighteen eighty five page three thirty three Fear and Trembling Introduction and Preparation by Soren Kierkegaard, eighteen thirteen to eighteen fifty five, published in eighteen forty three, translated by Lee Hollander in nineteen twenty three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Not only in the world of commerce, but also in the world of ideas, our age has arranged a regular clearance sale. Everything may be had at such absurdly low prices that very soon the question will arise whether anyone cares to bid every waiter with a speculative turn who carefully marks the significant progress of modern philosophy every lecturer in philosophy every tutor student every sticker and quitter of philosophy they are not content with doubting everything but go right on it might possibly be ill-timed and inopportune to ask them whither they are bound but it is no doubt polite and modest to take it for granted that they have doubted everything else it were a curious statement for them to make that they were proceeding onward so they have all of them completed that preliminary operation and it would seem with such ease that they do not think it necessary to waste a word about how they did it the fact is not even he who looked anxiously and with a troubled spirit for some little point of information ever found one nor any instruction nor even a little dietetic prescription as to how one is to accomplish this enormous task but did not descartes proceed in this fashion descartes indeed that venerable humble honest thinker whose writings surely no one can read without deep emotion descartes did what he said and said what he did alas alas 
that is a mighty rare thing in our times but descartes as he says frequently enough never uttered doubts concerning his faith in our times as was remarked no one is content with faith but goes right on the question is to whither they are proceeding may be a silly question whereas it is a sign of urbanity and culture to assume that every one has faith to begin with for else it were a curious statement for them to make that they are proceeding further in the olden days it was different then faith was a task for a whole lifetime because it was held that proficiency in faith was not to be won within a few days or weeks hence when the tried patriarch felt his end approaching after having fought his battles and preserved his faith he was still young enough at heart not to have forgotten the fear and trembling which disciplined his youth and which the mature man has under control but which no one entirely outgrows except in so far as he succeeds in going on as early as possible the goal which these venerable men reached at last at that spot every one starts in our times in order to proceed further preparation there lived a man who when a child had heard the beautiful bible story of how god tempted abraham and how he stood the test how he maintained his faith and against his expectations received his son back again as this man grew older he read this same story with ever greater admiration for now life had separated what had been united in the reverent simplicity of the child and the older he grew the more frequently his thoughts reverted to that story his enthusiasm waxed stronger and stronger and yet the story grew less and less clear to him finally he forgot everything else in thinking about it and his soul contained but one wish which was to behold abraham and but one longing which was to have been witness to that event his desire was not to see the beautiful lands of the orient and not the splendor of the promised land and not the reverent couple whose old age the lord had blessed with children and not the venerable figure of the aged patriarch and not the god-given vigorous youth of isaac it would have been the same to him if the event had come to pass on some barren heath but his wish was to have been with abraham on the three days journey when he rode with sorrow before him and with isaac at his side his wish was to have been present at the moment when abraham lifted up his eyes and saw mount moriah afar off to have been present at the moment when he left his asses behind and wended his way up to the mountain alone with isaac for the mind of this man was busy not with the delicate conceits of the imagination but rather with his shuddering thought the man we speak of was no thinker he felt no desire to go beyond his faith it seemed to him the most glorious fate to be remembered as the father of faith and a most enviable lot to be possessed of that faith even if no one knew it the man we speak of was no learned exegetist he did not even understand hebrew who knows but a knowledge of hebrew might have helped him to understand readily both the story and abraham one and god tempted abraham and said unto him take isaac thine only son whom thou lovest and go to the land moriah and sacrifice him there on a mountain which i shall show thee it was in the early morning abraham arose betimes and had his ass saddled he departed from his tent and isaac with him but sarah looked out of the window after them until they were out of sight silently they rode for three days but on the fourth morning abraham said not a word but lifted up his eyes and beheld mount moriah in the distance he left his servants behind 
and leading isaac by the hand he approached the mountain but abraham said to himself i shall surely conceal from isaac whither he is going he stood still he laid his hands on isaac's head to bless him and isaac bowed down to receive his blessing and abraham's aspect was fatherly his glance was mild his speech admonishing but isaac understood him not his soul would not rise to him he embraced abraham's knees he besought him at his feet he begged for his young life for his beautiful hopes he recalled the joy in abraham's house when he was born he reminded him of the sorrow and the loneliness that would be after him then did abraham raise up the youth and lead him by his hand and his words were full of consolation and admonishment but isaac understood him not he ascended mount moriah but isaac understood him not then abraham averted his face for a moment but when isaac looked again his father's countenance was changed his glance wild his aspect terrible he seized isaac and threw him to the ground and said thou foolish lad believest thou i am thy father an idol worshipper am i believest thou it is god's command nay but my pleasure then isaac trembled and cried out in his fear god in heaven have pity on me god of abraham show mercy to me i have no father on earth be thou my father but abraham said softly to himself father in heaven i thank thee better is it that he believes me in human than that he should lose his faith in thee when a child is to be weaned his mother blackens her breast for it were a pity if her breast should look sweet to him when he is not to have it then the child believes that her breast has changed but his mother is ever the same her glance is full of love and as tender as ever happy he who needed not worse means to wean his child two it was in the early morning abraham arose betimes and embraced sarah the bride of his old age and sarah kissed isaac who had taken the shame from her isaac her pride her hope for all coming generations then the twain rode silently along their way and abraham's glance was fastened on the ground before him until on the fourth day when he lifted up his eyes and beheld mount moriah in the distance but then his eyes again sought the ground without a word he put the faggots in order and bound isaac and without a word he unsheathed his knife then he beheld the ram god had chosen and sacrificed him and wended his way home from that day on abraham grew old he could not forget that god had required this of him isaac flourished as before but abraham's eye was darkened he saw happiness no more when a child has grown and is to be weaned his mother will in maidenly fashion conceal her breast then the child has a mother no longer happy the child who has lost not his mother in any other sense three it was in the early morning abraham arose betimes he kissed sarah the young mother and sarah kissed isaac her joy her delight for all times and abraham rode on his way lost in thought he was thinking of hagar and her son whom he had driven out into the wilderness he ascended mount moriah and he drew the knife it was a calm evening when abraham rode out alone and he rode to mount moriah there he cast himself down on his face and prayed to god to forgive him his sin in that he had been about to sacrifice his son isaac 
and in that the father had forgotten his duty to his son and yet oftener he rode in his lonely way but he found no rest he could not grasp that it was a sin that he had wanted to sacrifice to god his most precious possession him from whom he would most gladly have died many times but if it was a sin if he had not loved isaac thus then could he not grasp the possibility that he could be forgiven for what sin more terrible when the child is to be weaned the mother is not without sorrow that she and her child are to be separated more and more that the child who had first lain under her heart and afterwards at any rate rested at her breast is to be so near to her no more so they sorrow together for that brief while happy is he who kept his child so near to him and needed not to sorrow more four it was in the early morning all was ready for the journey in the house of abraham he bade farewell to sarah and eliezer his faithful servant accompanied him along the way for a little while they rode together in peace abraham and isaac until they came to mount moriah and abraham prepared everything for the sacrifice calmly and mildly but when his father turned aside in order to unsheath his knife isaac saw that abraham's left hand was knit in despair and that a trembling shook his frame but abraham drew forth the knife then they returned home again and sarah hastened to meet them but isaac had lost his faith no one in all the world ever said a word about this nor did isaac speak to any man concerning what he had seen and abraham suspected not that any one had seen it when the child is to be weaned his mother has the stronger food ready lest the child perish happy he who has in readiness this stronger food thus and in many similar ways thought the man whom i have mentioned about this event and every time he returned after a pilgrimage to mount moriah he sank down in weariness folding his hands and saying no one in truth was great as was abraham and who can understand him End of fear and trembling introduction and preparation by soren kierkegaard Further Remarks on the Policy of Lending Bodleian Printed Books and Manuscripts by Henry W. Chandler, M.A. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There are several reasons why it is in the highest degree improbable that I should take any part in the debate on the Bodleian Statute, but I reserve the right to handle in my own fashion any arguments that may be used and to supplement if need be any facts or supposed facts that may be brought forward during the discussion those who are in favor of changing the whole character of the bodleian and who wish to convert it from a library of reference into a library of circulation do not seem to feel much confidence in the strength of their case at all events they have made no serious attempt to meet the facts and arguments with which they are confronted but show a disposition to wander off into side issues of little or no importance. Before examining the letters of Mr. Sanday, Mr. Ellis, and Dr. Rost, as far as I know, the only advocates of lending that have yet ventured into print, it may be well to add some further evidence on the lending system, which was omitted from the remarks by inadvertence. The Advocates' Library is, as we all know, a lending library and in 1852 or thereabouts the librarian informed Dr. Bandinel that they had already lost nearly 7,000 works. In 1849, Mr. Maitland told a committee of the House of Commons that, quote, 
all the ordinary readable books for which there is a great demand are now reduced into a state and condition so bad that it is perfectly disgraceful unquote. and he was of the opinion that quote, the only satisfactory and practical reform in the advocate's library would be to put an end to the circulation of the books unquote. mr panisi a splendid librarian and a man with a head on his shoulders addressed a string of queries to thirty-six large continental libraries and asked inter alia whether they lent their books whether those books were in consequence lost or damaged whether the practice was complained of and whether the readers were inconvenienced by it six libraries out of the thirty-six never lent under any circumstances whatever thirteen returned either no answer or no clear answer as to the consequence of the practice three the public library at basle the university library at turin and st mark's venice reported quote, no inconvenience as resulting unquote. but the remaining fourteen told a very different tale from the royal library berlin quote, few books were lost unquote, but books were damaged at the city library burn quote, books do certainly suffer unquote, and readers are inconvenienced at the royal library copenhagen quote, many inconveniences are the consequence of such a practice unquote. Quote, books are lost etc a very eloquent etc especially if it be compared with the evidence of malbeck the librarian there see remarks page fifty nine at the city library frankfurt quote, books are not entirely lost but are often damaged unquote. at the public library geneva quote, books are lost and damaged unquote. at the brera milan quote, generally speaking books are not injured unquote. but readers are inconvenienced at the national library of paris it is hoped that rules have been adopted which would quote, prevent the great losses and just complaints of the public unquote. i may parenthetically observe that forty years ago or more the losses in this one library were estimated at fifty thousand volumes at st genevieve quote, the principle is acknowledged to be liable to many abuses unquote. at the mazarin library quote, the system is found very dangerous unquote. at the library of the institute the practice was condemned as quote, highly pernicious and practically liable to the abuses implied in the question unquote. at the ducal library parma books are not lost and quote, few slightly damaged unquote but readers complain of inconvenience at the imperial library prague quote, readers were inconvenienced unquote. and at wolfenbuttel quote, all the inconveniences mentioned in the question are the consequence of the system unquote. that is to say books were lost and damaged and readers were inconvenienced i have said that the answer returned from st mark's venice where lending on a very small scale prevailed was that no inconvenience was felt but it is well deserving to notice that the respondent continues thus quote, if librarians were asked all over the world and they would candidly answer the question one and all would deprecate the system of lending being liable to every one of the abuses mentioned in the question unquote. unfortunately librarians like other people will not always answer questions candidly there is plenty more evidence of this sort but what has been already adduced here and in the remarks is surely enough to prove the mischief inseparable from this silly practice even to the most obtuse of mankind here too is a very significant fact which ought to speak trumpet-tongued to the bodleian curators in eighteen twenty seven mr kerridge the public librarian at cambridge possessed an arabic manuscript a history of the berbers which was in the strictest sense of the word unique in one sense all manuscripts are unique for no two are or can be exactly alike but mr kerridge's book was the only known copy of the work in existence anywhere he was strongly urged to give or sell it to the university library over which he presided but he utterly declined to do either the one or the other because the cambridge library is a lending library few men he said know the value of manuscripts and he declared that there were only two libraries in england where his book would be open to the use of scholars and at the same time safe the british museum and the bodleian 
This manuscript now reposes on our shelves, and we got it simply and solely because in 1827, and for many years after, we still possessed common sense. Kerich would never have let us have this unique volume, had he supposed it possible that we should ever have been so forgetful of our duty as to lend Bodleian books. We might learn something from the Persians, who, as I was informed the other day, on what seemed to be very good authority, have a saying which runs thus, quote, The man who lends a book is a fool, but the man is a greater fool who returns a book that has been lent to him. Unquote. A fearful mixture of true with false doctrine. Now for the letters, and as Dr. Rost is a librarian, he shall have precedence. His epistle will be found in the Academy, March 5, 1887, and it is a real contribution to the facts of the case. It is reducible to two statements. 1. During nearly 18 years there have been from the India office, quote, thousands of loans, unquote, and, quote, there has not been a single loss to record, unquote. In February 1887, there were, quote, 337 Oriental manuscripts out on loan, 47 of which are in the hands of scholars in India, unquote. 2. Quote, numerous editions of texts and other works based on our collections of manuscripts would either have been impossible or at least not possible to their actual extent except for the existing arrangement unquote. here we have lending on a truly gigantic and imperial scale quote, thousands of loans unquote, and quote, not a single loss unquote. nothing said however about damage and deterioration which must have been considerable. Still, quote, thousands of loans, unquote, and, quote, not a single loss, unquote, is a mighty strong fact, so strong indeed that Dr. Rost may be congratulated on a surprising run of luck. But his marvelous good fortune is no argument in favor of lending. It is rather an argument against it. A man has been known once in his life to throw double sixes four times running in a game of backgammon, no other player, however, who has seen this done need expect to do the like, for the chances against him, if we merely consider the single and simple chance, are more than a million and a half to one. Strictly, 1,679,615 to one. Dr. Rost has lent manuscripts thousands of times, and they have always come back safely, not perhaps quite as fresh and sound as they went out, but still they have come back. Let no other librarian expect that the fickle goddess will treat him with like favor. Consider for a moment the evidence produced above as to the experience of other lending libraries, and you will find it impossible to believe that the Bodleian can meet with luck so entirely exceptional as that which has befallen the India office. It is so uncanny that, were I Secretary of State for India, I should certainly follow the example of Polycrates and sacrifice something very valuable, only not a manuscript. The safest thing, however, would be to stop the hazardous practice of lending, and tempt fate no more. The second part of Dr. Rust's letter merely re-echoes an argument used by Mr. Sanday and Mr. Ellis. Mr. Sanday's letter is printed in the Oxford Magazine of February 23, 1887. He sees, quote, two great, if not fatal, flaws, unquote, in my argument against lending out books. They are, one, that I... Quote, look only at one of the uses of a manuscript, unquote. and two, that I quote, immensely underestimate the value of the work that has been done upon manuscripts in recent years. Unquote. I plead an emphatic not guilty to both these charges. On what evidence do they rest? As to the first, the evidence offered is that quote, my idea of a manuscript appears to be that it should exist beautifully occasionally inspected by a connoisseur who strolls down to the library purely for his own amusement and with no further result worth speaking of unquote. then i am told that a great number of manuscripts are quote, valuable chiefly for their text unquote. and that when quote, they have been collated and the collation thoroughly tested their work in the world is to a great extent done unquote. very good now let us dismiss as extraneous to the present question manuscripts which are quote, works of art unquote, and calligraphic or paleographical specimens or curiosities 
and then let me ask whence my kindly opponent derives his information as to quote, my idea of a manuscript unquote. i'm curious to know because he certainly cannot have got it out of my remarks he must have other sources of information only i can assure him that he has been most woefully misled in short his notion of quote, my idea unquote, is wholly fictitious that a great number of manuscripts are quote, valuable chiefly for their text unquote, is a proposition so self-evidently true that it might have been thought difficult to find anyone out of a lunatic asylum who ever doubted it will mr sanday point out to me in anything i have ever written any passage which by any interpretation however forced could be made to say that the great proportion of manuscripts are valuable for much except their texts in the greatest libraries even in the bodleian the number of splendid manuscripts of manuscripts valuable as works of art or as paleographic monuments is comparatively small but let us suppose the fiction to be a fact let it be assumed that quote, my idea of a manuscript is that it should exist beautifully unquote. how would that be a flaw in the argument against lending bodleian books the argument to put it in its baldest form is that nothing that tends to damage a library ought to be done by those who really care for it but lending tends to damage a library ergo mino probatur whatever unnecessarily damages the books tends to damage a library lending does so ergo again whatever deters would-be benefactors from giving books tends to damage a library lending does so and so on and so on the remarks can be run out into mood and figure with no trouble at all how is this argument or any part of it vitiated if i were to say what i never have said that quote, a manuscript should exist beautifully unquote. let us clench the absurdity suppose i had been fool enough to say that no book should ever be looked at in the library for more than an hour a day even that would not vitiate the argument against lending books out of it have we forgotten in this once famous university what a contradictory proposition is have we as completely lost the art of clear disputation as we have forgotten the use of the rapier there are times when i think so come we now to the second flaw i quote, immensely underestimate the value of the work that has been done upon manuscripts in recent years unquote. suppose for a moment that i do how does that constitute a flaw in my argument it beats me altogether i cannot see it do not lend your books says the argument for five or six different reasons and i ask again with positive wonder in what way any of these reasons are contradicted even if i do underestimate the work that has been done on manuscripts what has the one thing to do with the other i could understand it if it were impossible to examine a manuscript in the library but that cannot be mr sanday's meaning or does he mean this if you do not let your manuscripts go out of the library and occasionally out of the country they will not be examined nor collated at all i hope that this is not his meaning for badly as i think of the state of learning here i have never thought so badly of it as this supposition would imply if after thirty years of constant quote, reform unquote, we are sunk so low that we neither can nor will use the treasures of the bodleian library ourselves why in that case i say let us give the whole of it away to some country where scholars are yet to be found a library in which no man works a library such as the bodleian is in the hands of men too ignorant or too idle to use it is dreadful to think of i however hope better of the place and i argued that we should not send our books out of the library because as one reason amongst others it would then be impossible for us to use those books in the library i wish to think of this university as still living and of its members as still lovers of learning for its own sake though i admit that this last effort cost me almost all the faith i possess but i trust that i have completely misunderstood the way in which my good-tempered critic would connect my underestimate of the work done on manuscripts with the argument against lending all this be it observed is on the supposition that i actually have underestimated that work this i do not admit to be the fact but whether i have or have not it in no way affects the argument against lending mr sanday's next point is that if we do not lend our books to foreigners foreigners will not lend their books to us which will greatly inconvenience english scholars and lastly that it is a great inconvenience not to be permitted to have bodleian printed books in our rooms quote, the purpose unquote, he says quote, with which one borrows books is mainly to complete a collection 
one has perhaps ten or twelve of the books one wants but just some two or three are needed which no other library but the bodleian can supply unquote. what does all this amount to why that it is a great convenience to have books and manuscripts out of the bodleian quis nagavit everybody admits it but the point and it is really astonishing how few people there seem to be nowadays who can see the point of anything the point is this which on the whole is the greater convenience to the greatest number of serious students letting books go out of the library or keeping them in it never to lend entails inconveniences lending also entails inconveniences on which side does the balance of inconvenience lie people feel as mr sanday confesses that he feels how convenient it is quote, to complete a collection unquote. they never for one moment consider that their convenience is another man's inconvenience provided they can get what they want they really seem to care not one farthing for anybody else in the universe it is almost needless to add that this remark does not apply to mr sanday if we did not send our books abroad it is certain that foreign libraries might and if they were wise would decline to lend us their books and a very good thing too it benefits us to visit foreign libraries and it will benefit foreigners to visit ours in these days of rapid and cheap locomotion there is less reason than ever for sending books racing about all over the world if you go to Samancas, to venice or to the public record office you may consult and copy records of spain of venice and of england for yourself if you had rather not go you can get attested copies of any document which you desire to have but you cannot borrow and it should be the same with all great libraries if a man wishes for a partial or a complete collation of a bodleian book or of a complete transcript he most certainly ought to be able to get it accurately done and i should hope that in this university he would get it done gratis though it would be no hardship or injustice if such work were charged for at a modest rate if a man unable to visit us is willing to pay for a transcript or collation and there is no one here able or willing to make it then there is a substantial grievance but in no seat of learning ought such a thing to be possible in any university that deserves the name and especially in a university so richly endowed as ours is there ought to be and if funds were not wasted there might be a number of keen-eyed men skilled in every ordinary language of europe and of asia able and willing for the mere love of learning to do this sort of work thoroughly well it should be the same in london it is shameful to us as englishmen considering what our eastern empire is that there should be the least difficulty in getting any manuscript properly transcribed or properly collated either here or at the india office let us reform ourselves in very deed and not in name only as quickly as may be although a university does not mean a place where the omne shible is either known or taught it is certain that such a university as oxford pretends to be and might have been ought to contain even amongst its college fellows men skilled in all but the most outlandish tongues mr ellis's letter appeared in the academy of february twenty sixth eighteen eighty seven it consists of two parts more or less intertwined that is to say of objections to opinions which he believes me to hold though i do not and of an attempt to justify the lending out of books the personal part i do not mean this in any disagreeable sense has been answered so far as it required an answer in the academy of march fifth eighteen eighty seven and need not be repeated here mr ellis thinks that the tone of my pamphlet quote, is to say the very least reactionary unquote, and he describes me as the exponent of quote, a reactionary movement against the study and use of manuscripts unquote. the pamphlet says in effect that the curators have for years past been doing a wrong thing and a thing for which they had no statutable warrant it gives reasons why the thing is both wrong and foolish and it begs the university to put a stop to the wrongdoing this mr ellis calls quote, reactionary unquote, a violent misuse of an adjective as it seems to me then he makes out entirely to his own satisfaction though hardly it is to be thought to that of his readers that i object to the presence of an undergraduate in the bodleian anybody who reads the remarks with ordinary attention will see that in the passage where alone the word occurs page forty six it is used to denote a species of the unlearned and surely no one will deny that it is rightly so used for not one undergraduate in five hundred could be properly described as learned 
but if any undergraduate is learned i have never objected to his presence in the library how could i object when i have said more than once that the bodleian was founded and endowed by learned men for learned men not a year ago i introduced to the library a very young cambridge man whom i firmly believed to be an undergraduate and i congratulated myself on having turned loose into that glorious place exactly the sort of person that bodley laud and selden would have welcomed for he was at once a scholar and a lover of books it turned out that my young friend was not an undergraduate at all but a recently made bachelor of arts but that makes no difference as far as i am concerned i believed him to be an undergraduate when i offered to be his sponsor so much for the charge that i would exclude undergraduates from the bodleian i would exclude just as bodley ordered all unlearned people and therefore almost all undergraduates i would welcome all learned men and women too and therefore any one graduate or undergraduate who is learned nor should i take quote, learned unquote, in a very strict sense mr ellis declares that he should regard the change in practice which i advocate quote, not only with grave distrust but with a quite lively resentment as an outrage and desecration unquote, to the memory of the late mr cox i understand this rather tall talk and others do the same, to mean that Mr. Cox approved of the practice of lending books and manuscripts. Now I have uncommonly good authority for saying that Mr. Cox viewed the lending system with as much disfavor as I do myself. How could it have been otherwise? Mr. Cox was a librarian who knew his business, and what the practice of such a library as the Bodleian should be. The curators, the greater number of whom were profoundly ignorant both of books and of book management, coerced him he was obliged to yield but i am assured that he detested their barbarism quite as much as i do the rest of the letter merely puts forward the plea of convenience over again and like the rest the writer does not see that neither i nor anybody else have ever questioned the convenience of the practice i find that some readers of mr ellis's letter suppose the sentences in inverted commas to be all mine but that is not the case several of them are expressions which he supposes wrongly enough i should or might use i have for instance nowhere objected to the nasty habit of biting your nails though mr ellis puts the objection into my mouth so long as a man merely bites his own nails i should say nothing whatever i might think it would of course be different if he were trying to bite my nails every member of convocation has a right to criticize the new statute and therefore no apology need be made for the following remarks for the first time in the history of the Bodleian, it is proposed plainly and clearly to invest the curators with the power to lend books. From the foundation of the library down to 1873, they had no such power, no such right. Nevertheless, from 1862, they did, as a matter of fact, lend manuscripts and printed books. It was their custom, their most, to do so. On February 28, 1873, they resolved that they would, quote, proceed by statute to take power to order the lending out of books under certain restrictions unquote. now no sane man resolves to quote, take power unquote, to do what he already has the right to do this resolution then was a distinct confession that for years past the curators had been acting unstatutably and that it is probable perhaps certain that the words secret most fuit in the extraordinary statute of eighteen seventy three were intended to cover and condone the illegal acts of the previous ten or eleven years an intention completely frustrated by the unparalleled bad latin in which that statute is expressed whether a permission quote, to borrow books for learned men unquote, conveys to the curators the power to lend them is very doubtful indeed if it were not so it is difficult to see why the curators applied for the statute now before us were any one to maintain that the curators have now no power to lend books and that they never have had it since the library was founded he would not find much difficulty in proving his case to the satisfaction of all reasonable beings the present statute proposes to give them this power though not in perfectly unobjectionable terms for it first allows them to lend manuscripts and then declares that no rare book shall be lent without the consent of convocation now a manuscript is more than rare it is unique no two being exactly alike there is an ambiguity here which will be found in practice to breed endless difficulties then again who is to judge of the antiquity rarity and so forth of any book printed or manuscript 
either the curators must decide these questions for themselves or they must act on the judgment of the librarian knowing what it now knows is the university really prepared to say that the existing board shall decide such questions and if not is it ready to leave matters so complex and difficult to the judgment of any one man be he who he may lastly the librarian is permitted to lend books neither rare nor valuable and it is left to him alone to decide whether a given book is or is not rare or valuable to those ignorant of books it will seem easy enough to settle this question though it is one to frighten a man who does know something about them nothing is stranger than the sudden way in which some books become at first scarce and then totally disappear for nearly forty years i have been on the lookout for two english books which i read as a child one a book of voyages and travels the other a cheap edition of the arabian nights and never once in all that time have i had a chance of buying either they seem to have vanished one would have said without hesitation that they were not rare and certainly not valuable yet they are absolutely unprocurable but this is a technical matter which will hardly interest the congregation it is more to the point to insist that the rules for lending drawn up and approved by the curators should be revised and approved by convocation and that without its consent they shall neither be altered nor abrogated even so it will be impossible to prevent frightful mischief if the thoroughly bad principle of lending is affirmed is it not clear that the paris rule should be adopted that rule is that only duplicates of books neither rare nor valuable the exact words of the regulation are quoted in the remarks page forty three shall be lent but it is hoped that the university will follow the excellent example of the british museum the oriental congress has been moving heaven and earth to get the trustees to sanction the loan of oriental manuscripts quote, under proper guarantees unquote, and they have brought considerable pressure to bear but the trustees as well as the responsible officers in the museum have given the oriental congress its answer the authorities in great russell street know their business and they utterly decline to lend on any terms let us be as wise as they are if the present statute is passed no one can be so foolish as to suppose that it will be long obeyed or that it will not be soon relaxed the question really is between lending and not lending the lending if sanctioned in any form will at first be limited it will rapidly become unlimited a rat hole in a dike lets the water in at first in a dribble then in a stream finally away goes the dike and irreparable mischief is done so will it be with lending only that the dike which defends the bodleian will be bored in an indefinite number of places every borrower will act the part of a rat the borrower's list which this statute legalizes for the first time will soon embrace the name of every graduate in oxford it is so convenient to have the exact book you want in your own room yes unquestionably most convenient but what is the price you pay for this convenience a ruinous one you destroy the bodleian as a library of reference quote, once or twice a year unquote, says mr warren c academy march twelfth eighteen eighty seven quote, graduates like myself go up to oxford on a short visit with pages of references to verify anxious to see new or back numbers of the review celtique paleographic society publications etc it is both inconvenient and disappointing to be told as i have been told more than once that such and such a book is out on loan and cannot be had the inconvenience will become greater as the circle of privileged borrowers becomes larger unquote. this is the language of a student and the language of common sense the benefit of the reference library cannot be exaggerated and it must be clear to the meanest capacity that lending and deposit cannot possibly be combined it is not difficult to damage or destroy the usefulness of the bodleian and the statute on which we are now to vote is the first step downwards to lend books out of such a library as ours is an act opposed to the teachings of experience nor can it be said that the course which we are invited to take is one sanctioned by those who are eminent authorities on such a question the men who for years past have been persistently trying to force this fatal policy upon the university may be remarkable on more accounts than one yet they are assuredly not remarkable either for their acquaintance with books and libraries or for their knowledge of the bodleian to them it is merely a large library not essentially different from the london library or from muddy's and they propose to treat it accordingly no mistake can be greater the bodleian is no ordinary library it is one of the wonders of the world and are we going to be such vandals as to sanction a practice which can only end in its destruction 
End of Further Remarks on the Policy of Lending Bodleian Printed Books and Manuscripts by Henry W. Chandler, M.A. Read by Donald Cummings. How to Pitch to Babe Ruth by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To the editor. This is just a few items of information about a ball player that maybe you haven't never heard of him, so I will tell his name in the first paragraph, and his name is George Root, but they call him Babe on account of him being over six feet tall and pretty near as wide, and he is a great left-hand pitcher that don't pitch. Well, one day in May I had seen a whole lot of different sporting events that bores you to death, and the White Sox from Old Shy was playing in New York City, so I thought I needed a little more boring, and I went out to Polo's grounds and went down on the bench, and Manager Gleason was sitting there, and he says hello to me, but I just made a face at him, but he asked me to sit down a minute, and a boy named Wilkinson was going to pitch, and he was out there warming up, and finally he got warm and come into the bench, and Manager Gleason said, Come here and sit down a minute, Wilkie, as I want to talk to you. So Wilkie sat down, and Manager Gleason said to him, Say, listen, Wilkie, there's a man on this New York club named Root, and he isn't Cobb, and he isn't Speaker, or Sizzler, or Jackson. He's a bird that if you ever throw a ball where he can reach it, that ball won't be available for tomorrow's game. And baseballs cost as much money as other commodities nowadays. So if you don't mind, why, when this guy comes up there, don't pitch him nothing that he can lay his bat against it. But roll the ball up there on the ground, and I will take the consequences. So Wilkie said, yes, sir. Well, they started this game in the first inning, and the White Sox didn't do nothing. And it comes to New York club's turns to get their innings, and they was two out, and Pip got on first base, and along come Ruth. The next I seen of that two-dollar ball was when it was floating over the right field bleachers. So, when Wilkie come into the bench, Manager Gleason says, What did I tell you? And Wilkie said, I didn't mean to pitch it where it went. So the next time Babe come up, all he got was a three-base hit, because they were pitching more careful to him. Well, after a while, it come necessary to put in a pinch hitter for Wilkie, and little Dickie Kerr was sent in to finish the game. Manager Gleason didn't tell Dickie where to pitch the Babe, because Dickie's what you might call a old-timer. So Dicky pitched one at this bird's Adam's apple, and he hit it into the right field stand for another homer, as I have nicknamed him. Now this isn't no reflection on neither of these pitchers, which I hope is both friends of mine, but if I was managing a ball club in the American League, I would tell them how to pitch to this bird. I would stand on the mound and throw the first ball to first base, and the second ball to second base, and the third ball to third base, and then I would turn around and heave the fourth one out in right field, because he couldn't be in all those places at once, and further and more, there's a rule that makes a batter stand in the batter's box, and if a person pitches in that direction with this guy up, why all you can say about them is that they're a sucker. For instance, the last time the White Sox was here, a certain prominent Chicago baseball writer was sitting next to Colonel Houston that owns a chunk of the Yanks, and this George Ruth comes up. And the colonel says to him, How much will you bet that he don't crack one out of the park on this occasion? So the baseball writer says, What's the proper odds? So the colonel says, Well, I don't want to cheat you, and I will bet you a pint to court that he murders one. So the sucker took it, and the first ball was a foul that went into Mr. Shork's feet. And the next was a ball, and then the old boy took one right over the middle for another strike, and the next one hasn't yet been located but when last seen was soaring over a cigarette sign in right center. The most useless thing in the world when this guy's up there to bat is the opposing catcher, because if you can throw a ball past Mr. Ruth, why, it don't make no difference if it's catched or not, whereas if you try and throw one over the plate, it won't never get as far as the catcher. A couple of weeks ago, a guy come here with the St. Louis Brown and struck the babe out five times in one afternoon, and if he is smart, he will let that go down into posterity, and the next time they tell him it's his turn to pitch versus the New York club, he will say he has got a sore arm. End of 
How to Pitch to Babe Ruth Read by Rick Rodstrom Human Longevity by Joseph R. Buchanan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Human Longevity by Joseph R. Buchanan the possibility of long life illustrated in the first number of this journal may easily be corroborated by referring to numerous examples but the fact that the nobler qualities of human nature are the most efficient promoters of longevity is our most important lesson and it is illustrated by the superior longevity of women he is a misanthrope who does not recognize their superior virtue and he is a poor statesman who does not wish to see that virtue imparted to our political life and who does not recognize the importance of giving to woman the most perfect intellectual and industrial education that she may be self-supporting the british census shows that there are nine hundred and forty eight thousand more women than men in great britain the st james gazette says professor humphrey of cambridge has prepared a series of tables which contain some interesting information about centenarians of fifty two persons whom he mentions at least eleven two males and nine females actually attained the age of one hundred others attained very nearly to a hundred years only one of the persons reached one hundred and eight years while one died at the alleged age of one hundred and six of the fifty-two persons thirty-six were women and sixteen men out of the thirty-six women twenty-six had been married and eleven had borne large families of the twenty-six who had been wives eight had married before they were twenty one at sixteen and two at seventeen twelve of the fifty-two centenarians were discovered to have been the eldest children of their parents this fact adds dr humphrey does not agree with popular notions that first children inherit a feebleness of constitution nor with the opinion of racing stables which is decidedly against the idea that firstlings are to be depended on for good performances on the course the centenarians generally regarded were of spare build gout and rheumatism were as a rule absent it seems says professor humphrey that the frame which is destined to great age needs no such prophylactics and engenders none of the peccant humours for which the finger joints as in gout may find a vent of the fifty-two aged people twenty-four only had no teeth the average number of teeth remaining being four or five long hours of sleep were notable among these old people the period of repose averaging nine hours while out-of-doors exercise in plenty and early rising are to be noted among the factors of a prolonged life one of the centenarians drank to excess on festive occasions another was a free beer drinker and drank like a fish during his whole life twelve had been total abstainers for life or nearly so and mostly all were small meat-eaters the oldest woman in austria at this time is magdalena ponza who is one hundred and twelve she was born at wittingau bohemia in seventeen seventy five when maria theresa sat on the austrian throne george the third had then been but fifteen years king of england louis the sixteenth who had ruled a little more than a twelvemonth in france was still in the heyday of power the independence of the united states of america had not yet been declared napoleon and arthur wellesley were as yet but six years old magdalena ponza retains full possession of her mental faculties unfortunately she can only speak the czech language and she can neither read nor write however she answers questions briskly enough through the youngest of her surviving grandchildren herself a woman of sixty Magdalena Ponza's age is authenticated by the outdoor relief certificate of the Viennese municipality. Of American centenarians, we have a number, some of whom are still living. Harrisonville, New Jersey, has two, Michael Potter and Bartholomew Coles. Polly Wilcox of Hope Valley, Rhode Island, celebrated her centennial last year. So did Jane Wilcox of Edgecombe, Maine while she had a sister ninety-four and a daughter eighty-one 
old auntie scroggins of forsyth county georgia is now one hundred and four years old and is still one of the most effective shouters of the methodist church to which she has belonged ninety-four years miss phoebe harrod of newburyport massachusetts celebrated her centennial last year she still takes a lively interest in passing events grandmother sarah drew at halifax celebrated her centennial a year ago her constant companion is an old bible which has been in the drew family for two hundred and fifty years mrs trifine bevans of danbury massachusetts held a lively centennial reception in the parlours of the west street church april the fourteenth eighteen eighty six her health hearing and speech were good and her step brisk she attributes her age and good health to good habits and allowing nothing to trouble or worry her she has always been a strict church member william waterman of oshkosh wisconsin is said to be one hundred and nine years old it is said he is a methodist uses liquor and tobacco and finds no fault with the world joseph o'neill of barnesville georgia might have been living still if he had not been frozen to death last winter at the age of one hundred and seven in a sudden blizzard he was a negro and had over two hundred descendants mrs elizabeth thomas of reading pennsylvania who had lived a century might be still living if she had not been killed last year while walking on the railroad track of those who overrun the century we might mention further simon harris who died in putman county indiana last january aged one hundred and nine his memory was good to the last mrs elizabeth small relict of dr samuel small at lewiston maine had passed her hundredth birthday a few weeks when she died of apoplexy and mrs susan phillips of wilson creek north carolina died last year just as she finished her century nathan formerly slave of benjamin w bodie died last year in mississippi talbot county aged one hundred and seven christopher mann of independence missouri died last year aged one hundred and eleven the oldest of all and probably the oldest minister in the world is the rev thomas tennant of vineyard township arkansas an itinerant methodist preacher born in seventeen seventy one now in his one hundred and sixteenth year mr edward gentry told a more remarkable story at indianapolis last july he was at the governor's office and gentlemen were guessing at his age none supposed him over fifty but he said he had a son fifty-two years old and was himself seventy-eight he added my doctor has given me a fifty years longer lease on my life barring accidents my father is one hundred and twenty-eight and is still living my mother died at the age of one hundred and seventeen and her mother lived to the same age mr gentry is of english birth perhaps the best specimen of family health is that of the atkinson family of gloucester massachusetts nine children were born and all lived the first death in the family was a few weeks ago when john atkinson died aged eighty-four when he died the ages of the nine amounted to seven hundred and three years aunt dinah john the oldest indian in the onondaga reservation died in may eighteen eighty four aged one hundred and nine about ten years ago when governor seymour was about to make an address at an indian fair on the onondaga reservation aunt dinah walked upon the platform and asked to be introduced to him mr gardner said governor seymour this is aunt dinah who wants to become acquainted with you oh no him get acquainted with me aunt dinah explained me know him before he know anybody many years ago me go to pompey hill his father's grocery governor's father say my squaw very sick i ask what matter his father say go in and see for yourself he go into a room see a little papoose about a foot long then moving toward governor seymour and pointing her finger at him she said that papoose was you governor seymour born that night aunt dinah called frequently at mr seymour's and took especial delight in rocking the cradle and showering caresses in her native fashion upon the future governor of the state about three years ago she became blind and has since been kept at her home in the onondaga reservation she retained her faculties to the last her husband died thirty years ago 
her dying request was that the pagan ceremony be first observed and afterward the christian ritual what are we to reckon says the home journal as to the declining period of man's existence the point at which old age taps us on the shoulder and says it comes to keep us company varies with the individual it depends a great deal on circumstances which are hardly the same in any two cases some writers have said that a man is old at forty-five others have set down seventy as the normal standard dr john gardner who has written on longevity remarks long observation has convinced me that sixty-three is an age at which the majority of persons may be termed old and as a general rule we may adopt this as the epoch of the commencing decline of life suppose then we agree to call no man old till he is past sixty-three let us set down the names of some of the illustrious people of the world who have prolonged their days of usefulness after that age we shall make a table of them and begin it with those who have died at seventy that is to say with those in whom the springs of life have not stood still till they have had at least seven years of old age it will be found however to be far from exhaustive and every reader may find pleasure in adding to it from his own stock of information age at death seventy columbus lord chatham petrarch copernicus balanzani boerhaave gaul seventy one linnaeus seventy two charlemagne samuel richardson alan ramsay john locke necker seventy three charles darwin thorwaldson seventy four handel frederick the great dr jenner seventy five haydn dugald stuart seventy six bossuet seventy seven thomas telford sir joseph banks lord beaconsfield seventy eight galileo corneille seventy nine william harvey robert stevenson henry cavendish eighty plato wordsworth ralph waldo emerson kant Thiel, william cullen eighty one buffon edward young sir edward cook lord palmerston eighty two arnaud eighty three wellington goethe victor hugo eighty four voltaire talleyrand sir william herschel eighty five cato the wise newton benjamin franklin jeremy bentham eighty six earl russell edmund haley carlyle eighty eight john wesley eighty nine michelangelo ninety sophocles ninety nine titian one hundred fontenelle it may be said that they were exceptional in living so long but if what the best authorities say to be true the exceptions ought to be the people who died young and not those who prolong their lives and carry on their work till they are old few of us may find ourselves like lord palmerston in our greatest vigour at seventy or be able like thiers to rule france at eighty or have any spirit for playing the author like goethe and victor hugo when over eighty or for playing the musician like handel and haydn when over seventy but by good management we may do wonders the wisest men and the best have been conspicuous for working to the end not taking the least advantage of the leisure to which one might think they were entitled they have found their joy in pursuing labours which they believed useful either to themselves or to others john locke began a fourth letter on toleration only a few weeks before he died and the few pages in the posthumous volume ending in an unfinished sentence seem to have exhausted his remaining strength the fire of galileo's genius burned to the very end he was engaged in dictating to two of his disciples his latest theories on a favourite subject when the slow fever seized him and brought him to the grave sir edward cook spent the last six years of his life in revising and improving the works upon which his fame now rests john wesley only the year before he died wrote i am now an old man decayed from head to foot however blessed be god i do not slack my labours i can preach and write still arnaud one of the greatest of french theologians and philosophers retained says disraeli 
the vigour of his genius and the command of his pen to his last day and at the age of eighty-two was still the great arnaud it was he who when urged in his old age to rest from his labours exclaimed rest shall we not have the whole of eternity to rest in a healthy old age cannot be reached without the exercise of many virtues there must have been prudence self-denial and temperance at the very least according to the proverb he that would be long an old man must begin early to be one and the beginning early just means taking a great many precautions commonly neglected till it is too late more people would be found completing their pilgrimage at a late date if it were not that as a french writer puts it men do not usually die they kill themselves it is carelessness about the most ordinary rules of healthy living the enjoyment of old age may be looked on then as a reward and the aged may pride themselves on being heirs to a rich inheritance assigned to forethought and common sense many years are an honour they are an honour even in the case of the worldly and a great deal more so when life has been regulated by motives higher than any the world can show the hoary head says solomon is a crown of glory but he adds this qualification if it be found in the way of righteousness old people form a natural aristocracy and to be ranked among them may be recommended to all who have an ambition to close their lives well up in the world for a picture of an old man in this enviable state of mind take cornaro in his eighty-third year we find him congratulating himself that in all probability he had still a series of years to live in health and spirits and to enjoy this beautiful world which is indeed beautiful to those who know how to make it so even at ninety-five he wrote of himself as sound and hearty contented and cheerful at this age he says i enjoy at once two lives one terrestrial which i possess in fact and the other celestial which i possess in thought and this thought is equal to actual enjoyment when founded on things we are sure to attain as i am sure to attain that celestial life through the infinite mercy and goodness of god jeremy bentham who lived to be eighty-five retained to the last the fresh and cheerful temperament of a boy john wesley who died when he was eighty-eight also had a happy disposition i feel and grieve he says but by the grace of god i fret at nothing goethe who reached his eighty-third year is another good example then there is burhava one of the most celebrated physicians of modern times who held that decent mirth is the salt of life indeed in the case of most old people we believe it will be found that cheerfulness is one of their leading characteristics the recent death of mr beecher who with his splendid constitution ought to have lived twenty years longer illustrates the principles of hygiene which he blindly disregarded for years he was threatened with the form of death that seized him and came near a fatal attack some years ago in chicago while delivering a lecture men of a strong animal nature hearty eaters and restless workers making great use of the brain are liable to such attacks if mr beecher had observed ordinary prudence and had a little scientific magnetic treatment he would never have had an apoplectic attack but he was commonplace in thought he went the old way and died as short-sighted men die he had read my anthropology and told me he kept it in his library but its thought did not enter into his life end of human longevity by joseph r buchanan